obviously as the Scottish Government welcome this final report. So what particular recommendations or strands within that report will lay down the foundations for future government policy? Well, I think some of the key issues are firstly that the definition of sectarianism isn't quite as simple and, and straightforward as per perhaps people have imagined. Uh, the debate has been characterised in a particular way for many decades and it's much more sophisticated and nuanced view that we have to take of what sectarianism is, sectarianism is at a local level to the individual or to the community that's affected by it and therefore how our solution has to be tailored to that community. So the second thing which I'm particularly uh, focusing on is the importance of community action and the communities taking control of the issue themselves and determining their, their own future. So it's a kind of empowering thing but it's also about understanding we need to gain knowledge at a local level and therefore inform our action at a local level. So the projects we have been funding have been successful uh, and uh, that gives us hope that the approach that we're taking is, is working at a local level. We just need to try and find a way of mainstreaming that activity to the rest of the country. Okay. Again, in this final report, there's a recommendation to, um, if you like, to penalise uh, football clubs who don't address sectarianism proactively. Do you think that, as it stands currently, they are a bit of a stumbling block to Scotland eradicating sectarianism? Well, there's no doubt that all aspects of society we need to do more, and that's not just about football. I mean, we know sectarianism doesn't, uh, you know, it's not entirely due to football, and it's not uh, football's responsibility to, 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 to kill sectarianism off uh, itself. But football is a means by which sectarianism manifests itself. Clearly, we know from the research that, that Duncan Moore and the advisory group have published that football um, is perceived by the public to be a part of the problem and a significant part of the problem at that. So clearly we want to work with football clubs, uh, football authorities to do more to tackle the issue. Um, the difficulty for us is we, we need to respect the independence of governance of football uh, for very practical reasons and we need to uh, you know, invite the football authorities and clubs to look at the report, pick up the messages that are there for them and reflect on those and come forward with their own suggestions if they think there are ways in which they can tackle it. I am aware of the, the agenda around strict liability and the importance of that. And, but I have seen some really positive things happen uh, in attending football matches where fans have policed themselves. So there is hope that you know, when sectarian or offensive singing takes place, fans can actually self-police and they booed that singing until it stopped in one game I attended. So that's a positive thing. So fans can play a big part in it too. Uh, it shouldn't just be about the football clubs, the football authorities, but we all as individuals who attend football matches or, or and participate in any way in football can do more to tackle it ourselves. Now this um, report from the advisory group probably won't be sitting in isolation if we look no. at uh, <laughs> the review of uh, your uh, uh, Football and Offensive Behaviours and Threatening Communications Bill. So will we find within a revised bill some of the recommendations that the report has? Well the first thing to say is the, the evaluation, uh, fortunately it's, it's relatively soon. Um, and I have to respect sort of parliamentary procedure, so I'm, I can't divulge what's, what's in it, but the evaluation looks at a number of issues, the experience of football fans themselves, uh, experience of others, stakeholders, the police, and others um, across Civic Scotland in terms of their approach to the Offensive Behaviour and Threatening Communication Act, and um, we will report on our response in some detail to that in an appropriate time. Um, but all I will say is that, uh, you know, Legislation, important though it is, is only one part of the picture. Uh, if we rely entirely on legislation to solve this problem, we will we'll not succeed. We need communities, organisations such as football clubs, but also others, public sector employers, private sector employers, community groups, churches, um, all to take this issue seriously and all to think, is there something more we can do to tackle this? It is one manifestation of hate crime. It's not the only, sadly, manifestation of hate crime, but it should be seen in that wider context. And that's Perhaps another message that comes from the report about we need to see sectarianism as part of a wider picture about tackling hatred in our society and making sure that nobody should be growing up or working or living in Scotland with fear or, or, or feeling that they are being discriminated against on the basis of their differences from others. Now you put a particular emphasis on tackling sectarianism right at the grassroots within the heart of Scotland's communities. Mm -hmm. You talk about community projects. Yes. Now, what is the evidence that you have now? There have been several projects working in terms of local and youth work projects, young people's projects, about how they engage more successfully. 
Well, I've seen some excellent examples. Um, you know, some people may be tempted to dismiss things that are involve creative sector or drama or theatre productions, music, but they're really powerful as a medium to get across a very difficult issue, one that perhaps uh, we, we still have a taboo about in Scotland. So people can sit and listen or, or watch uh, a production and perhaps be more affected by that because it's, it, it gets under the radar, it hits you, um, perhaps. And I've, I've experienced some of the plays, tr tremendous plays, uh, and uh, musical performances that, that bring to life the issue of sectarianism and make you think about all its manifestations. So it's not just about the traditional old firm rivalries that people think about and perhaps the history going back to, to the 17th century. It's discrimination against people, perhaps even more recent migrants on the basis of their religion or people with disabilities. So it, it does feed into a wider spectrum of, of hatred and discrimination and prejudice that we need to, to affect. So that's very important. Um, but I have seen evidence of it in terms of meeting individuals who say themselves that through participation in these projects they have turned their lives around. Folk who have been trying to convince their children to continue the prejudices of their generation, saying they greatly regret that and doing now working as volunteers to try and turn that around and get people to think uh, differently. And as I, uh, I've cited a number of times now, the projects like uh, in North Motherwell, Wishaw, where you've got Faith and Community Project, where you've got different churches coming together, where clearly to my own eyes, I could see f strong friendships have been formed and people thinking, right, rather than what divides us, what can we do together to regenerate North Motherwell? So what can we do as a community, rather than two communities, what can we do as a community to tackle North Motherwell? That's a hugely positive step. And if I've got, and I've said before, if I've got real hope, it's really among young people. Because we're going around the schools, you see the, the excellent work that's done in schools. You see young people uh, in places like Barhead, where you've got a denominational school and a non-denominational school working together to break down any, any perceived glass curtains, I think, as, as uh, Duncan Morrow would refer to them. So I think it's hugely positive. It's hard to put a finger on what impact that is having in, in pure um, uh, empirical terms, but I've seen it myself. I know it's working. On the issue of schools <coughs> and the curriculum for excellence, how are you going to practically integrate that within the curriculum for excellence? Well, I think that's an important point. I mean, I think, um, you know, when we talk about, you know, across a number of subjects, you can look at issues, uh, I've dealt with it before in terms of climate change, how you can weed that in, uh, weave that into the, um, uh, the wider curriculum for excellence agenda. Things like uh, discrimination, prejudice, hatred can be, can be uh, taken forward in forms of, you know, any study of English uh, language, you know, in terms of uh, the creative work we're talking about, drama, poetry, uh, music, where it tackles these issues. So you can see how that would be relevant, obviously history, modern studies, how we study the, the society in which we live, any discussion around citizenship. So you can see how sectarianism and the wider role it has within uh, you know, purporting sort of hatred or prejudice can be, can be treated as a subject that can cut across a number of different issues, whether it's geography, history, um, or even, uh, even the science scene where, you know, from the point of view, we are, we are the same people and um, biologically, scientifically, we are the same. So um, it's really just about uh, you know, a, a prejudice that we need to put behind us and get people to think rationally about the issue. Do you think that sectarianism is one of these issues that it's maybe a bit of a postcode lottery, if you like, across Scotland, where not all schools are tackling it? Maybe they're in areas where they feel it um, sectarian doesn't, sectarianism doesn't exist. Yeah. Or maybe there's sometimes a nervousness amongst um, teachers to actually address this issue? I think there probably is, uh, that's true, I think there has been historically a taboo, there has been nervousness about confronting this issue. I suppose what the advisory group report does is um, shine a light on it and say that we actually have to confront this. And uh, I, I was fairly complacent about the fact that I lived in an area like the borders where I thought sectarianism wasn't really something that was, was, was significant. I uh, discovered when I took this role there actually is a sectarianism project in Gala Shields and uh, soon after the recent um, Old Firm uh, semi-final someone was arrested uh, for a sectarianism offence in, in, in the border so uh, you know so you know it, it does happen and it does happen across the whole of Scotland and I think we need to recognise that in our response and it'll be for individual communities depending on the nature of how it manifests itself it may not be you know street violence or, or, or any kind of uh, manifestation there, it may be more low level but continual chronic kind of discrimination that just a small group in, in the community are facing on a daily basis. And we need to be able to f discover that and find out how we tackle that at a local level. Uh, but we, to do that we need people to be brave enough to recognise there's a problem 
and to, to try and uh, understand how it actually happens at a local level and to formulate a response to it at a local level. And the best approaches will be ones that are driven by communities for communities rather than government you know, dictating what should happen at a local level. You have talked about the importance of local communities, but there's also our massive online community that we are all part of. Yes. What is the way forward in terms of that? Well, I think the report and the wider discussion about this, raising people's awareness of what constitutes sectarianism, people might think it's okay to have a bit of banter um, you know, and, to, and to share jokes, which to them they think, think are funny, but actually they need to stop and reflect that uh, especially when you're broadcasting something through social media could be deeply offensive and uh, and could really upset people uh, you know and people their friends even that they may not be aware that it's really going to hurt them so i think uh, we all have to stop and reflect can we do more as individual users of social media as consumers of social media when you see something to stop it you know to to, to actually challenge it and say actually that's that's not right you know you shouldn't say that and actually just try and, try and uh, self-police, a bit like the fans at the football match. You know, get across that actually that's not okay. That's not okay in the 21st century. That should be behind us. Nothing wrong with celebrating cultural strengths and cultural identities, but not when it's at the cost of someone else or to disparage someone else. And I think we need to support those who've got very uh, important things to them in terms of their culture, to celebrate their culture, but do it in a way which is not about damaging someone else or denigrating someone else. I think that's an important distinction we have to make. Um, clearly, the offensive behaviour and threatening communications at football um, does does does, um, does tackle that, um, but that's only one part of the picture. We all can do a little bit of self policing and uh, and also police others as well, and just sort of say, look, you're my friend, but I'm just saying to you that's not okay, um, and just just challenge things where we can and uh, be be uh, brave enough to do that. And where do you see the next steps for the AOS, the Action on Sectarianism National Portal? Well, we, you know, we think it's very important that we disseminate what's, what's happening to the wider community. Clearly, as we look to communities to take forward action, they will be looking for, thirsting for information about what's maybe been happening elsewhere. So if there are information portals that show what can be done at local level, keep people informed about um, you know, what, what uh, support and resources there are available to help them, uh, you know, how they can maybe speak to a, a peer community somewhere else to say, look, how did you tackle it? These are all very important things. So having important online and, and indeed um, more traditional means of, of disseminating materials are really, really important. And that's why I'm, I'm very positive about sort of the cultural stuff too, because, you know, once something gets ingrained in the culture, it becomes um, organic. It, it kind of takes on its own life, it will stimulate other projects, people will be inspired by that and maybe come up with their own work, so it's, um, uh, it, it can, can take on a life of its own. So I think the more we can do to disseminate to those communities that aren't involved in community projects that we're funding, what's possible that they can maybe take on the challenge themselves and, and uh, be inspired to, to take action at a local level, because it gives them hope as well that something can actually happen.